down to Acapulco. I know I'm headed down to Acapulco with the long white sands where I might have a chance. Yeah, we're going to head down to Acapulco. Uh, good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. So uh, my talk is going to be about where I see the direction that the West is heading towards. I'll start with, I'll break my talk in these subtopics. I want to talk about myself, who I am, and I want to talk about the interplay between three or four key issues, democracy, a very fanatic, godless, valueless religion that human beings have in invented. I want to talk about a secular stagnation that is, in my view, going to be the way forward for the West, and why. And why this is all happening? Because you have accepted cultural Marxism. In my view, nothing is going to turn around until democracy has ended and until the nation state has come to an end. So this is going to be a long process. I want to talk about some future outcomes I see, some specific ones. And um, finally, if I have time left, I'll talk about some of the measures you can take to protect yourself. As one of the speakers said earlier, it is no longer about living in one country anymore. You might want to have a citizenship of one country, live in another one, make your money in the third one, et cetera, et cetera. And I'm going to talk about some of my views on this subject. So about me, I speak, this is not what I do usually, but I speak on mining conferences around the world. I'm an analyst. But I, my real calling is philosophy. I write extensively on philosophy, anarchism, and economics. And the reason I don't like to use the word Austrian before economics is because that's the only economics. Everything you hear about is superstition, irrationality. Uh, I advise, the way I make money is to advise institutional investors. And I recently spearheaded an $80 million deal in North America. I started Indian subsidiary operations of two European companies. I was one of the first few in early 90s who went back to India at, for, at Swiss salary plus hardship allowance to go back home and start Indian subsidiary of a Swiss company. Um, one of the subsidiary I started became the market leader in its product segment, and it actually, the turn, it's interestingly, the subsidiary now owns the British company I opened the subsidiary for. I've changed my country of residence five times, and I've been to 70 countries, and I'm often traveling. I travel about eight months a year, and that is the reason why I'm here to talk with you today. But let me talk about my childhood. I grew up in a small town in central India. It was a socialist paradise. Uh, my money could do only three or four things. We could buy grocery. We could go to a tea shop to get tea with some snacks. We could go to the city center, which were all gold shops. And this is still only gold shops in the city center. We could go to watch movies, and that was it. There was nothing else in that city. There were a couple of cars in a city of 100,000 people. There were a few scooters. Until my mid-teens, I did not know. I did not know what the television was, and I did not know what the refrigerator was. When I went to do my MBA in the UK, I was sitting in, the, in my classroom l hearing these words called McDonald's and Pepsi and Marks and Spencer, and I had absolutely no clue what those things were. When I got a plastic piece from my bank, I sat down with my Indian friend to try to figure out what that card meant. I did not know what an ATM card was. 
Let's talk about culturally a socialist paradise, and that, will, that might help you understand where, how far the West has to deteriorate. Socialist, this is the real definition of socialist paradise. It's a society that lack rational and ethical moorings. It's a confused society, indoctrinated, corrupt, hypocritical, inhuman, and a hellhole of mentally and physically diseased. And because once your feet have slipped, once you have lost touch with reason, it only gets worse and worse. I, I migrated to the West, and then after several years, I left the West. And what follows is my thinking behind why I left the West. The disaster of democracy. Now, a lot of people don't define words properly. The word democracy does not mean what it used to mean. It has completely changed its meaning in the last 200 years. During the Rom Roman Republic times, and when at the end of Age of Enlightenment, 200 years back, when democracy was adopted as the way of governance in the West, in North Europe, it was not, it had nothing to do with the democracy you have today. In both those times, only a select few were allowed to vote. These were people who were wealth generators, businessmen, artists, people who had taxpayers. And these were the kind of people, a select minority of the population that was allowed to vote. But today, democracy has changed its meaning completely. Everyone has the right to vote. And that is where the problem is. Because this minority, which earlier had the right to vote, they influence nothing. You can shout as much as you want to, ladies and gentlemen. Your voice goes unheard in the West today. What votes today is the masses. They decide who runs the government. The least competent people decide who runs your system. <clears throat> so let's digress. In my view, what happened was that West peaked morally and intellectually about 200 years back. And you have been in a slow decline, except for the fact that economic growth continued, so you did not really feel this decline in moral and intellectual aspects of the Western civilization. Let me digress. Most of my talk is about the West, but let me digress a bit to tell you about democracy. In the last few decades, what has been happening? In popular culture, World Bank, IMF, all the big Western governments will claim that democracy brings equality, liberty, freedom. And a lot of libertarians think that democracy is somehow synonymous with freedom and liberty. They think democracy leads to reduction in tyranny, and they think that democracy leads to reduction in wars. Amartya Sen, a famous um, professor of economics in the UK, he got Nobel Prize. He wrote a book on how democracy leads to reduction in wars. And ladies and gentlemen, that's pure bullshit. <laughs> I, I have spent a lot of time thinking about which country improved after it became democratic. So let's consider examples of the last few decades. Virtually all of Africa has, in phases, accepted democracy. Africa is a complete disaster. I still go to Africa several times a year. It's a complete disaster. It will blow up at one point of time. Look at the Middle East. Exactly the countries that adopted democracy at some, some time in the past are the countries that are worse off today than non-democratic countries in the Middle East. Southeast Asia, where I come from, democracy is a complete disaster, although despite information age, 
People don't even hear about what's happening in, in Southeast Asia, the chaos, the human rights violations that take place in that, that area. So, and look at Myanmar. I mean, people are so euphoric about what's happening in Myanmar. It's probably facing the worst genocide of this century right now. Syria, a lot of my friends, libertarian anarchist friends, were very euphoric about Arab Spring. They thought it was a move of, towards democracy. This is what Arab Spring has brought us, Syria and the migrant crisis in Europe. So let's look for the core reason why this democracy goes wrong. Because, ladies and gentlemen, anywhere in the world, even in the most enlightened societies, Switzerland, places in Scandinavia, the majority of people, I would say anything between 70 to 95% of the people do not think. They will not think, and they would rather die than think. <laughs> These are the people who vote in your elections. Problem is that for governance, you need thinking, you need reasoning, you need to plan about tomorrow, but the masses cannot think about tomorrow. They are driven by their animal instincts. They want everything now. They are driven by their survival needs, and they are driven by feelings, not reason. Democracy must, therefore, end up in bread and circuses, and then collapse. That was the few, that's what happened in Rome, and that's what's going to happen in the West, and a lot of other countries outside the West as well. Let's talk about this secular stagnation that's happening in the West. Um, a lot of people I respect, Austrian economists, people I follow, 10 years back believed in that the US dollar would collapse. Ironically, US dollar has been among the best performing currencies in the world. And I fully believed in it. I shorted US dollars in Canadian dollars. I have lost a lot of money. And I'm, I'm, I claim to be an advisor. Asset prices, I shorted American stock market. What has happened with, to the American stock market? It has gone up hugely. The reason these people explained was, and they were quite right and rational, that when you print so much of fiat currency, your paper much must collapse in perceived value. If you print so much fiat currency, malinvestment must take place, which means that asset prices should have collapsed. The stock market did not. There was an expectation of hyperinflation in the US. Um, quite rightly, if you print so much, hyperinflation should have happened. But we can argue about inflation numbers, but I'm sure all of you will agree there is no hyperinflation in the US. Moreover, people were talking about shorting European and American bonds. The irony is that not only these bonds have done very well, they today trade for negative yields. But, of course, these federal bank people were not really geniuses because they were printing all this fiat currency to start manufacturing. Alas, Europeans and Americans and Canadians are not investing. In Europe, you can buy sovereign bonds for negative yields. I think there are about 12 countries whose bonds trade at negative yields. And in the US, publicly listed companies sit on a total of about $4 trillion, or that's the figure I know of. So what went wrong? What went wrong is that regulations have suffocated your economy. You are repressed in terms of businesses, entrepreneurialism, and creativity. Everyone, the first thing when you think about creativity, you think about where regulators might trouble you these days. Everyone is obsessed with regulators. 
In my view, the reason why bonds are trading at negative value, the reason why stock market has gone up so much is because negative yields is slowly being perceived by the West as the future. Now, this is a new concept, negative yields, in the West, or at least among the people I know, they did not really know about the negative yields. But in the mysterious lands of the Middle East and Southeast Asia, one of which I grew up in, negative yields is everywhere. What is negative yields? Um, the natural state of humanity, of the universe, is entropy. Everything has a tendency to disintegrate with time. But you, the Western civilization found something very valuable. They found a glue that not only stopped disintegration, it allowed for accumulation to take place. And that was the concept of reason. Greek or Roman philosophers found the concept of reason, which has been the which is what differentiated the Western civilization from the rest. And by rest, I mean virtually everything outside the West. But something, as I said, that once the West started accepting democracy, it was already losing its foothold on reason. It was preparing itself to accept cultural Marxism. We are self-responsibility was going to be taken over by entitlements. Today, young people in the West think it's their right to get something. Um, there is an emergence of moral relativism in the West. And most, a lot of people today worry about security rather than liberty and freedom because they are so well-fed and so well-catered to that they don't really care about liberty anymore. Now, this is the problem. This is what I experienced growing up in India. I still spend several months a year in India, and things are not changing. India has been a shithole for the last thousands of years, and it will continue to be one for many generations. Uh, why, why, is this, why is the West losing its concept of reason? And the reason is simple. Masses go by feelings. Masses cannot think about tomorrow. And because masses cannot think, the kind of steps that they want, they, want, they feel like taking today to address the problems they have are exactly the same things that created your problem in the first place. So this vicious cycle is in no way going to stop until democracy has ended in the West. Now, this looks very far-fetched, but that's the kind of time frame that I think the West will continue to deteriorate before there's a chance for a revival. I don't know how much time I have left. Um, uh, so. Let's talk about the concept of government today. Um, 200 years back, again, I'm going 200 years back, end of Age of Enlightenment. Governments, the, the people who worked for the government were selected out of the society. They were invited to work for the government. Now, I'm not saying these were saints in any way, but these were people from businesses. They were wealth generators. They were artists who were invited to work for the government. These were not professional bureaucrats. They were not professional politicians. They always, this was only a part-time job for them, and usually they were not paid. Today, what do you have? These people go from mommy's lap to study in an Ivy League college, and then they go to earn a quarter of a million dollar salary working in Washington. The problem is that these people have zero real life experience. They live in clouds somewhere. Even if they are so-called honest, they have no concept of what ground looks like and feels like. 
And they have absolutely, <laughs> and these people have absolutely no clue how wealth is generated. I have run, I have started and run several businesses, and I know how painful it is to make money and how to start a business. But these guys have no problem. They have never generated wealth, so they have absolutely no problems in forcing increasing amount of regulations on your life because they don't understand it, and they trade favors among themselves anyway. And masses have no problems with that, and that is about maybe 70 to 90% of the population because they are net beneficiary. They don't do businesses. They are not creative. They worry about their weekends uh, when they go to the office Monday morning. Um, sorry? Absolutely. So um, now, so, so remember this thing. Government structure is the same. The kind of people who ran, ran governments 200 years back were relatively much more competent than what you have today in the West. At the same time, 200 years back, your economies were almost 70 to 90% agricultural economies. Agriculture is a minuscule part of your economies today. It has become an extremely complex economy in the West, but the government structure is still the same. Now, there is another problem. These governments today are structured to continue to grow in size, and this was possible. Governments have go grown continuously in the last 200 years. Now, when government were growing, at the same time, economies in the West was growing continuously because there was an effect of industrial revolution is still continuing in the society. We have accumulated wealth. Technology has enabled continual economic growth in the West. Unfortunately, what you see today is a stagnation in the economy. So as I said, government are structured the same way as they were structured 200 years back. They, the government are designed to continue to grow, but there's another problem, another huge problem that the West now faces. They are today designed in a way that they will grow the most when this economy stagnates because welfare payments will kick in. This sets you in a very vicious cycle. Now, it's very hard to predict the future, and I try to do I try to predict the future. As I said, as an advisor, I made many mistakes, and I continue to make a lot of mistakes. But two things I think are reasonably sure about, and these are those two things. What happened in Cyprus will happen to you. And it will happen the most in the Western countries because your bureaucrats are self-righteous, arrogant, and actually, relatively honest financially. They are well paid. Why should they not be honest? Cyprus will happen to you. Your accounts will get frozen at a flip of a software switch. Now, this is the next one is not a matter of if. It's a matter of when. Next, when, nine, when the next 9-11 happens, US and the UK, at least, will get locked down. And the reason is that North America is not very immune to shocks. Europeans have lived through shocks over centuries. So these are the two things I think every North American and every Western person should prepare for. Let's talk about, just to digress a bit again, what might happen in some of the nations outside the West. Um, as I said, Arab Spring was, a pro was not about, was a democratic movement. But what do people imagine when they think about the word democracy in those countries? For them, democracy is a magic wand which gets them something for nothing. They have been taught by the United Nations, World Bank, et cetera, et cetera, that all you have to do is to become democratic and things will change for you. Nationalism is on rise everywhere in the world. And this is the problem which I think a, part, a major part of the world will, will face. 
and that is the Middle East, Southeast Asia, and Africa. The, the fear of United States and money of United States keep those countries together. This glue, this fear will go away as US falls in economic power, which it is already, and moral power. US has lost a huge amount of moral power it had over the world over the last two, three decades. I would expect some of these countries to disintegrate, uh, Africa, Middle East, and Southeast Asia, including India and Pakistan. Expect a very unstable world. Now, some of you might be thinking, um, what a pessimistic talk I'm giving here. Uh, but I don't have to feel pessimistic. I'm actually very optimistic and happy. I'm only looking at facts dispassionately and with equanimity. Tell me what's wrong with them. But let me give you a pes optimistic sentence here. This is, the f this is the best time in the history of humanity for you to live a free life. The technology, cheap, cheap traveling, has enabled you, and internet has enabled you to live your life the way you want, with as much freedom as you want. And as you, you heard from several people in the audience and speakers, that's actually possible. So this is my conclusion uh, about my talk before I close it with some how you might want to protect yourself. Nation state is a dead man walking. The, the forces of government structure being too brittle and is it being structured to grow while its economy stagnates and entitlement oriented masses will mean that these forces just don't add up. It will create so much pressure that nation state is a dead man walking. But of course, for anarchists and libertarians, this, this is not the full story, because you have a lot of pain in between now and then. Uh, democracy is truly the worst form of government, governance. And I don't see an economic revival. Remember, the names you are usually given about countries that improved in their economies because of democracy, let's name some of them. Chile, South Korea, Taiwan, Singapore, they took off not when they were democratic. They were non-democratic countries. The best story of this, of the last 50 years, is China, which is not a democratic country. Democracy, okay, two more minutes. Okay. Um, so democracy, okay. democracy puts you on a vicious cycle, and there's no evidence whatsoever to, pr to show that democracy helps in any way. I think as long as you have democracy, intellectual and cultural degeneration of the West will continue. There's nothing that can stop it because the masses run your, your institutions and governments. Um, I, I disagree with some of the other speakers earlier who said that we are moving towards world government. I think all forces at play are such that world will become more disintegrated rather than integrated. So these are just some random thoughts, not a full spectrum of possibilities. But I think the future, when all is done, the future will be of city-states. And I think Singapore and Hong Kong are some of the good places to keep some of your wealth to protect yourself. Switzerland, Dubai might be good as well. But Switzerland is surrounded by Europe, which might become a problem. Among the big countries, and I know there's a lot of negative press about China, and I go to China again uh, multiple times a year. Remember, Chinese IQ is among the highest in the world. They are the smartest people in the world. This is a society where ideologies of the masses are at check, and I like it that way. I'm an anarchist, but I don't like these people obstructing my roads, creating problems in the society because they want to steal, they want to use the government to steal from my pocket. Uh, also, China is one of the best countries in terms, it's the, probably the only country in the world that can uh, resist pressures of the United States government and other Western governments. Hence, your enemy of your enemy is your friend. 
Keep an eye on China. You can open accounts in China very easily. I'm not sure about Americans, but usually it's very easy. Look at South Korea, Japan, Malaysia. Uh, very culturally, very immune countries to shocks and very complex, very safe, worth looking at. I like South America and New Zealand because there is this international war between three religions going on right now, and these two places are probably most immune to those religious wars. Again, there has been a lot of press about, negative press about Chinese currency. And you know, Chinese currency falls by 0.8%, and they say China devalues. In the meantime, Canadian currency fell by 30 to 40%, and no, there's no news, there's no headline about Canada. So this is, the, this is the negative mentality they have about China. But no, Chinese currency, if you account for the fact that they actually pay you interest, has probably been the best currency in the world and might continue to be among the best currency. Look at Hong Kong dollars, Singaporean dollars, and actually stock markets in these countries because under the fear, Western people have pulled their money out of emerging markets, but they have erroneously pulled their money out of Hong Kong and Singapore as well. They should not have. But in a negative yielding system, which Middle East and Southeast Asia has known for a very, very long time, what do people do? Because when you're manufacturing and infrastructure does not give you a positive rate of return, you invest in gold. They are not, those people are not experts in monetary economics. They buy gold because it does not lose the weight. The weight of gold does not go away with time. It's a zero yielding asset, hence much better than a negative yielding asset. And that is why Middle Easterns and Southeast Asian own gold. Gold, negative yields are becoming, emerging in the West the, today. Eventually, they will become more and more accepted as the part of the Western economy. When, when it does, gold will become a good place for you to store your surplus. Thank you very much for your time. I want to dance by water beneath the Mexican sky. Drink some margaritas by swinging blue lights.